Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome and good morning also for those that are now following us on my YouTube channel from the Americas. Uh, my today's guest has been a political analyst and a veteran radio talk show host since 2006 and was an adjunct professor of criminal justice at the Anne Arundel Community College, if I'm right. Uh, looking at his activity through the years, he counts with unlimited participations in several media outlets. At, as well as um, he also counts with uh, many other participations and contributions from to 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 many uh, not only media outlets but also many YouTube channels as well as many other projects and alternative projects both from Western countries and from other countries as well. I shared on the description of this live stream the links where you can follow his activity. It is a tremendous pleasure to me uh, to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Garland Nixon, say please, uh, say please good afternoon on salute. Garland Nixon, you are free to make any questions and comments on the chat box that you have here uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, and we are reading it uh, at the same time that you are writing it. So, dear Garland, on first place, let me thank you for accepting to be with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, as I said to you before, a significant part of my audience belong to the Portuguese-speaking countries. Not only, but a majority is based on countries like Portugal, Brazil, Angola and Mozambique. And I always like to start my conversation with my foreign guests by asking them about the context and the, the affinity that they might have with my country. So let me ask you, if is this the first time you visit Portugal, so to speak? Yes, um, I don't, um, I've never been to Portugal. My nephew lived in um, Brazil for many years. So that's kind of my, the closest that I had. He was a journalist and he stayed in Brazil for uh, for several years. So, and he speaks fluent Portuguese. So that's as, uh, as close as I've come. <laughs> no, so never been here in, in our country. I hope that someday uh, you will be able to visit us uh, to enjoy our country uh, at the same time, if possible, Brazil because now these two countries, these two Portuguese-speaking countries are becoming uh, more and more uh, paying attention more to the alternative channels that we have, not only on YouTube, but also the alternative media, because uh, people are starting to um, dislike more and more the mainstream media channels uh, because they, they know that most of them are biased, not only uh, re concerning the, the the cover that they do uh, of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, but also concerning many other issues, for example, in domestic politics in the United States of America. But let me ask you this, what happened in your life that made you dedicate yourself to communication and analyze the type of cases that you are now dedicated to, as well as the product, projects that now you're uh, deeply dedicated to? Well, I think um, it's that, that, that it's not a matter of as much as what that some events happened in my life that pointed me in that direction. I think it's just my nature of being extremely curious, um, curiosity and um, a combination of that and um, concern for justice and an opposition to injustice. So when I see things that are unfair, um, when I see things that are unjust, uh, unjust, um, I feel motivated to discuss it, to act uh, on those things. And also, as you know, I, I, I taught for a while and um, I was in law enforcement for many years. And even in law enforcement, I taught, I ran our police academy and training academy. So I have an inclination to, um, I love to learn, so I love to read. You can see behind me, there's lots of books. So I like to read, I like to learn, I like to teach. So I like to find things out and then clarify issues for other people as best I can. And I think that's my motivation. It's kind of a teaching motivation. Using various contexts, one of the things that happens in our media today, one of the things that happens with our um, <clears throat> the issues of information coming from the government is that we often don't get a historical context. Our government says, well, um, the Ukraine conflict happened last February. It, that's where it started. Various conflicts start started whenever um, it is convenient for the government's narrative. Where I, I'm inclined to say that there are historical contexts that we need to 
understand in order to be able to um, navigate the current things going on, uh, geopolitical trends, geopolitical actions going on. So I think it's very important for people to look into not just general historical context, but things that are very specific. If you want to know, understand the Ukraine conflict, you need to know the history of Ukraine, the history of the Ukrainian um, relationship to the Soviet Union and Russia. If you want to understand what's going on in Africa and Russia right now, you need to know historically what happened as the Soviet Union worked with a lot of, or, but literally armed and trained a lot of the um, liberation movements in Africa and how the African people use that historical context to view Russia today in their various struggles against what they interpret as imperialism, um, imperialist economic theft. That's the way they see it. So that's that. I think it is important to educate people about historical context so they can understand what's going on today. What so? How do you think that the the American audience presently looks at the conflict? And do you think there was any significant change when uh, compared to the the same the same audience, the American people, uh, back to uh, the the beginning of March 2022? I think it's important to understand, and when it comes to um, when it comes to any group, the American audience, I think it's uh, important to understand that there are various groups in the American audience that view things very, very differently. You know, if you take any group of people, um, there within the group, that group, there are going to be various ways of viewing the world and various groups that see things very differently. So the American audience would have to be broken down. Keep in mind in America right now, we've got two major political parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Each of those parties now are about 30% of the public, which means that 40% of the public is neither Republicans nor Democrats. They're independents to some extent. Many of the, these people have, you know, kind of abandoned the political system. They don't, they've thrown in the towel, they've given up, they don't vote, they don't participate because they don't feel as though there, there's any opportunity for them to, to make a difference or have their voice heard. That's important to understand. Um, so what we have is to me, a that you've got the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, which is the ruling party for now, um, is very much aligned with the um, the narrative of the power players in the intelligence community and in the more in the, um, the, the 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 current government structure, right? The kind of worldwide, uh, basically viewing the world as a hierarchy where the United States is at the top of this hierarchy and everyone else has to acquiesce to our commands. So the Democratic Party right now is very, they're, they're really very much a contradiction in that they argue that we're fair and we want to look out for everyone and people of all races and creeds and color. They say that, but their foreign policy is exactly the opposite. We've got the Republican Party, which is traditionally a conservative party, which is still very much aligned with the worldview of, you know, conquest and American exceptionalism. But there's a significant strain in the Republican Party that's beginning to push back and question the um, the leadership of the uh, of the U.S. And then there is a certainly um, a increasingly uh, a, a growing community in the U.S. that is rejecting the, you know, forever war concept for rejecting the, you know, the United States needs to go around and be the world's policeman. And there's a growing community of uh, people in America who, um, as do I, reject the mainstream news and the mainstream narrative and are saying, look, you know, why don't we, why is it that Americans are going around the world spending all of this money on war and bases? And when you look at the, de de and we, we, at the same time, that we have significant economic and cultural decay and literally physical decay and deterioration of our country. So, there are various, that's, it's important to understand those competing forces in the United States right now. But those, what about those 40% that you just, men just mentioned? Uh, how can they organize themselves and have one single voice and also organize in a political movement or party in order to have a representation in the Congress or in any other political bodies? Well, see, the, the, 
Uh, okay, a couple of things. That's difficult because within that 40 percent, there are people like me who are former Democrats, but are far to the left of the Democratic Party. Right. In in that group, there are also people who are conservatives who were former Republicans who are far to the right. So there are people that have a significant distance between our ideological views. So it's not easy. However, we are starting to see more of an alignment. Um, with these groups because of what you're doing, what people like us do, and that is an alternative news community that is not as much aligned with ideology as it is with right or wrong, with trying to find the facts, with trying to figure out what's in the best interest of the people. And that is creating an interesting alignment between previously um, people who would have ideological differences that you know could not be overcome. And, and let me say this, this is critical. Moving into the 2024 election, you see uh, uh, Robert Francis Kennedy Jr., RFK Jr., Cornell West, Donald Trump, right? Now, Donald Trump is saying, you know, there are certainly things I don't, significant disagreements with ideological with Donald Trump, but Donald Trump is pushing back on some things on the system, some areas that he's pushing back when it comes to war and things of that nature. You've got, you've got RFK Jr. and, um, and uh, Cornell West, who also are pushing back when it comes to foreign policy. So they're going into 2024, we're seeing, and let me add this, I think that's a manifestation. I think that is an expression of what's going on with the American people. The American people are starting to more and more demand that the government starts focusing on internal issues and stop spending all of our money and all of our time and all of our focus on running and controlling the world. I think that concern from the American people is being expressed through a Trump, an RFK Jr., or Cornell West, who, while there are ideological differences there, there are pushbacks against this, uh, you know, America, world police, world controller, <laughs> dominator of the world um, mentality. So do you believe that, for example, uh, Cornell West could actually be uh, a, a good alternative, a good candidate, or he's just playing the, the 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 role that many other candidates do on every election, just to run from the primaries and then see to how it goes. I think a couple of things going on. <clears throat> I think Cornell West, um, number one, um, <clears throat> he, he he believes what he says. Cornell West is not the kind of person that works for the system and he goes along. Cornell West is a person who believes in what he says. Nothing has changed before with him. And he, um, I would compare a Cornell West position to like, a, you know, Martin Luther King, a person who believes in peace and in, believes in looking out for the best interest of the least of the poorest of those. So the, the man is a, has a very, takes a very moral political position of right and wrong when it comes to war, when it comes to injustice, when it comes to looking out for the poorest people. You know, here's a, a man who says, we, we have to stop looking at other countries as adversaries. When we look at Russia or China or Iran, we can't look at them as adversaries. We must look at them as, as he says, precious human beings. Hmm. So that's his, uh, and so I, you know, so I think he can be a significant player <clears throat> in that he provides a moral alternative. And I think that's very positive. And I don't think that he's going to just go away. And I do think that his voice um, does express what a lot of people believe in America. Um, so I think he's in there for the fight. The Democratic Party, um, RFK Jr. is running in the Democratic Party, which in my opinion is so corrupt that I don't, I don't believe he has any chance whatsoever to win because of the level of corruption in the Democratic Party right now is, is at a level that, quite frankly, they could not afford to have someone in power who would ask honest questions. You know, who, who would start, you know, opening their, you know, closet doors to see what's in it. The level of corruption over the last several years has gotten to a point. I mean, if you are a if you have such a corrupt organization, you can't bring in a new boss who says, I, I'm not corrupt. And I'd like to look at what we're doing and see what we're doing, because if they if, 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 if he were to start, if anyone were to start looking around at what the Democratic Party has done, has been doing or really what the what the U.S. government has been doing um, over the last several years, violating our own laws, violating international laws, lying to the American people, et cetera, um, it would it would disrupt our country to a point where 
our government would no longer be recognized as a functioning entity. It would be seen for the corrupt machine, you know, the, the, the corrupt machine of theft and war that it has become. You know that what, what worries us here, uh, not only in Portugal, but also in Europe as a whole, is the fact that uh, when Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks, they released all those uh, telegrams, all that info, no one actually asked uh, if that information was uh, true or false. They just, the, the only problem that we saw was, at least from the American side or the Democratic side, and especially by Hillary Clinton, uh, by Hillary Clinton supporters was only, well, that information should never be unveiled and should never be released. They are not denying the, the, the huge and very uh, information of very much importance. So, and this concerns us because we don't think and we don't see the American supporters of the Democratic Party actually trying to um, demand account the, the accountability values and principles that usually uh, the Americans spread, the American political power spreads worldwide. Well, the our political parties, in, to, to, to a large extent, have been turned into the equivalent of, of, of sports teams, like two soccer teams, right? And so if you're a member of the Democratic Party, then you support your team. This is the blue team which means that anything that can help your team win, regardless of whether it's true or false or whatever, then you're on, you support that. Anything that could hurt your team, anything that could, even if it exposes corruption against your team, you oppose that. They don't view politics from the perspective of a morality, of right and wrong, of justice or injustice. That simply, if our guy, I'll put it like this. This is the way I like to put it. They're who people, not what people. Right. A, I'm a what person. If someone says that a, a particular person committed a crime or did something wrong. Right. A right. who person just simply knows to know needs to know who it is. Who is it? It's one of your political enemies. Well, then I support going after him. Who is it? It's one of your political allies. Then I oppose going after him. That's a who person. I'm a what person. A what person says, I don't care who it is. It could be one of my community, one of my um, uh, uh, um political enemies my political my worst political adversary but is it just or unjust what is the claim against this person let's look into the details in the background of the claim regardless of who the person is independent of the individual american politics has now become since it's such a team sport you don't even need to know what the allegation or assertion is you only need to know who it the, the, who, who it's made against the democratic party anything you say against donald trump or any of their political adversaries they say oh that's great we have to go after this person and we have to take them out and then whatever they need to do to justify it they do anything that's uh allegation that's made against joe biden or one of their political allies they they simply defend it they don't need to know what it is so we've gotten past the point of justice injustice right or wrong we're now simply talking talking about I support my political allies, I oppose my political adversaries, and it, it's an unjust and immoral and un unethical position to take, but that's American politics right now. Boogie, I call it the, the boogeyman syndrome. They give them a boogeyman. There's the scary boogeyman over there. It's Vladimir Putin, it's Donald Trump, it's whoever it is. And they simply say, thank you for giving me my official list of evil bad guys and villains and boogeymen. And now I will proceed to do whatever I can to go after this list that I've been given by my leaders. It's cult-like behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and presently, actually, concerning that that you are uh, speaking about, uh, we have presently in the in the movie theaters the the, the movie Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. uh, and you know the entire process that he had to face after he was considered the the father of the atomic bomb. But uh, the entire way that they they, they pursued in the Congress uh, in order to make Robert uh, Oppenheimer a kind of a boogeyman and a man that shouldn't be close uh, to, the, to the government or to any kind of public institution. Actually, do you think that this could be the kind of movie that can uh, bring some kind of light to the Americans and also to people worldwide and let them think that they can't presently uh, look at politics like they look at soccer and uh, there are presently two trenches and then I must choose one. Do you think that this could be an eye-opener and why do I ask you this? Because for example, presently you have Tanya Chutkan 
who became famous throughout the world for her decision in the Maria Butina case. Uh, and actually, this is the person who, who will have to deliver a verdict on the charges brought against Donald Trump. Do you think that this is some kind of Oppenheimer uh, revisited? Well, I'll put it like this. For starters, with the movie itself, I do think it's a great time for the movie to come out. I do think that the movie will cause some certain people to reflect upon the situation that we're in now and the great power conflict. So I think it's very positive. In fact, I will be speaking um, at a um, Sunday, this Sunday, at a um, uh, a rally at the United Nations in New York, in which we particularly um, commemorate the uh, August 6th, which was when the jump bombs was dropped on Hiroshima. Um, and we're going to talk about our op this movie. We're going to use that as an opportunity to bring up the issue of, of, of nuclear war. So I think that the, it, it was excellent timing for this movie to come out. How it's going to affect the electorate at a time where we have so much propaganda and brainwashing, I don't know how to predict over the short run versus the long run. Um, I think that to be quite frank, the only real thing that's going to uh, 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 change that's going to affect the way people see these conflicts and the way the danger that people see is what I believe is the upcoming significant economic pain. If you are looking at the um, economic factors in the United States and in Europe, it's very clear the direction that we're heading is a downward spiral. And I believe that the economic pain that's going to hit people is going to create a lot of anger and distrust of the government. And that will cause people to start asking the questions that they need to ask. Unfortunately, that's what it's going to take. But I believe that more often than not in the same way that American citizens tend to vote on what's going on in their everyday lives, their ability to economically survive and to you know feed their families, et cetera. That seems to be the main motivator. I think that, um, that I'll put it like this, that the Oppenheimer movie, that we, as the economic situation deteriorates in the United States, that movie will be one of the tools that those of us who are working to educate people about the danger of nuclear war and the need to de-escalate the military conflicts that have been um, pushed by, to be quite frank, by the United States leadership first and foremost, I think that that will be a valuable tool. So maybe in the short run, it will be a good educational tool, but I think in the long long run, it will be used for years and years to come by those of us who are working to to to, to educate the public. So uh, what I can at least take from your from your words is, uh, for example, I remember when I had the, the privilege to have here Scott Ritter as well as uh, Andre Martianov. I think I believe you 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 know both of them. Yes. Uh, and they both were uh, in, in agreement when they said that presently the American em empire is in decline. But this is not only a, ma a narrative. This is not only a matter of words. This is not a wishful thinking. This is actually happening, but many people are in denial. So can I take from your words that uh, actually you agree also with this kind of, of, of line of thought? Absolutely. The uh, the U.S. empire right now is in decay in a number of really, I would argue, in all areas. It's clear and obvious. If you come to the United States, you can see, you know, the jewel of the jewels of an empire. If it's the Roman Empire, the jewel of the Roman Empire was Rome. First of all, it was it, the major cities of an empire are always, you know, they're shiny and there's big things going on and beautiful parties and extravagant things happening in the cities of an empire. When the cities of an empire empire are decaying, it's indicative of the decay of the empire. You look at San Francisco, go to New York, on and on in the cities, what you see is crime on the increase. You see homelessness, uh, you know, in some cities, it's just, uh, you know, unbelievable to see the level of homelessness. Um, you now see uh, more and more, um, you know, immigrants who have been come to the cities who are literally camping out thousands of immigrants. So the decay, the visual decay of the cities is clear and obvious. And so you have a physical and a visual decay. Now you also have the infrastructure, which is falling apart because we don't read, but all of our money goes to the war machine. All of our money goes to the foreign policy war machine. So the uh, uh, infrastructure is decaying and more. And of course, the um, recently the United States uh, was downgraded 
the credit of the United States was downgraded. So you can see the, the uh, economic dec decay. So the, the, if, if any, um, in any area that you would evaluate the U.S. empire, there is decay. So it's cl it's clear and obvious, and Americans know it. The, 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 I think one of the things happening is this: Americans, all the Americans, intuitively know it and can see it. The difference is whether or not they individually attempt to understand the reason for the decay, or whether they accept the propaganda that they're given by the government, which is usually the decay is a cause of your neighbor. Well, that's something that he's doing. It's causing the, the poor people, the poor people, the immigrants are causing the decay. Uh, Vladimir Putin or some overseas imagined foreign um, boogeyman uh, villain is causing the decay. So do you, as I look at our leadership and say, if we we have decay on all fronts, then you have to fault the leadership that's making the decision. You, you have to fault the people who are guiding the ship, who are at the helm steering the ship. Or do you go all the way down to the galley slaves, the poorest people in the country, and do you blame the people who are, you know, victims of um, the people who are, who, are, who are guiding the ship. So that's the big question. Who do we fault? Who do we blame? Who do we look to to, to, to make the changes and to um, bear responsibility for the obvious and clear decay of the U.S. empire? I remember that uh, during the 80s and during the 90s, uh, big cities like Chicago, New York City, uh, they were all, they all, the, all of them, they had a uh, high uh, criminal rate, especially the homicide rate. We thought that it was part of the past, but now what we kind of uh, see is that this uh, trend actually now is becoming more and more worrying uh, in the Western cities, big cities like San Francisco, like uh, Los Angeles and so on, Seattle, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but do you think that this is a, a national problem, not just a local and some kind of uh, uh, a problem that is uh, located in some uh, some cities? Well, here's the, th the, the thing um, that um, where is it happening? That's the problem, right? It's happening all over the United States. It's happening in small towns. It's happening in the suburbs. It's happening in the cities. So you cannot say, well, it's only happening in the cities. It's only happening in the small towns. It's only it's happening all over the country, which means clearly and obviously that it's a national problem that it is clearly, I believe, related to economics. The history tells us in the United States that when the economic, when prosperity rises, crime goes down. When prosperity goes down and we fall into some kind of an economic plight, that crime goes up. Well, if you look at the numbers, recently um, there, there was a, an article, which I don't have handy, but it said that a, a huge percent of Americans don't have $400 for an emergency. So what I think oftentimes, I believe a big part of crime, there's an old term, crimes of desperation, crimes of despair, drug abuse goes up, alcohol abuse goes up. As despair goes up, these things happen. So I believe that what we're looking at when it comes to crime is a matter of despair and anguish of the American people at their economic circumstances. If you go into a poor neighborhood where people are impoverished, you're going to have more crime, where you have more desperation. Is it that the poor, that poor people are somehow less ethical or immoral than rich people? Well, certainly not. If you look at the rich people in America and their um, uh, international policies, we go around the countries, we we bomb people, we murder people, we overthrow governments, coups. I always say the CIA stands for coups, insurrections, and assassinations. So are the wealthy and powerful somehow more moral? No, they're going around the world murdering people by the tens of thousands and overthrowing governments. But the, um, so in a in a uh, impoverished area and in poverty, there's there's there, there's despair, and that manifests itself in crime. And it's not going to change as our uh, economic system uh, continues to to deteriorate. You can't just go to San Francisco. There we go. We'll fix it in San Francisco. Well, what about Los Angeles? Well, what about Mississippi? What about Louisiana? What about the rural areas? There's and we have people that try to blame it on one party or the other. Well, it's the Democrats. It's their party because the cities and that are run by the Democrats are. Well, every place is 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 um 
is uh, experiencing these, you know, uh, increases in crime, increases in economic pain. Um, so there are people that are trying to use this for political or ideological purposes to make their point, but reality continues to um, see an, a decline in um, the safety and the security of uh, the American experience. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and a few weeks ago, Henry Kissinger actually celebrated 100 years old. I remember reading in his biography uh, and in other works as well that he admitted the possibility of supporting a coup d'etat in Portugal after the 1974 revolution we had here. Uh, it did not advance, but support for coups d'etat in countries where the United States uh, presently does not see itself um, uh, as a good partners, it seems to be a pattern for decades. We can think, for example, of the, how the Panama Canal was managed to materialize. Do you think that support for coups d'etat to place people uh, in favor of Washington is already such a part of the DNA of the United States that it is already difficult to change this mentality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to our leadership, what's interesting is this in the United States there is a gap between what the leadership of this country does and what the people of the country know and understand so the country the, the leadership of our country there they had no friends there was any country that thinks the united states is their ally is the, the leadership of our country is their ally is severely misguided as many european countries are starting to learn now the united states there are only two kinds of countries that our leadership sees countries that they have um uh, 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 um, taken over and subordinated in countries that they intend to take over and subordinate. There are no other types of countries that our country, that, that the U.S. leadership views. And when they take over and subordinate a country, they put in a compliant government. Oftentimes they put in bases. These bases are not for protection. These are bases of occupation. So a lot of Europeans are starting to understand that they thought they had independence and sovereignty and they have no independence and sovereignty through the eyes of the U.S. empire and the leadership of the empire, that they are subordinate. And if the U.S. empire says to them, it is time for the leadership of Germany or whatever country, it is time for you on our orders to destroy your economy and destroy the livelihoods of your people. It's time to do that. The United States position is the leadership should do that because they're our puppets and they do what they are told. And Europeans are finding out, unfortunately, and, and, and through many methods, <laughs> that that is the reality of there are no allies of the United States. You are subordinated and you will be sacrificed if the U.S. empire um, understands that. I mean, if, the, if, if they need that to happen, you will be sacrificed. Well, and having in mind the, the, um, the first uh, uh, thoughts that you shared with us in the beginning of this live stream concerning Ukraine, especially when you said that uh, many people in the United States, like in Europe, same happens in Europe, they think that this uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine has just started since uh, 24 February uh, 2022. Uh, and I have had the opportunity to follow the political and social reality in Russia and Ukraine for many years now. And after the Orange Revolution of 2005, Euromaidan was perhaps the most impactful event in the relations between the former Soviet Socialist Republics. How do you look at these events, not only to the present conflict, but to, at least in an operational way of, of, of looking at it, but also on the political tensions in Ukraine for years. So you're saying, how do I, how do I view the Ukrainian conflict as a whole? And as a whole, yeah. Yeah, right. well, to me, if you research the Ukrainian conflict, it doesn't take very long to figure out what's going on here. If someone writes a book that says, you know, I'm going to go, hit Garland over the head and then I'm going to steal go into his house and steal everything that he has. And then you wake up one day and there's Garland with a lump on his head and everything in his house is gone. You don't have to be, you know, um, Inspector Cousseau to figure out what happened. We The, the United States, um, the big new Brzezinski wrote a book called The Grand Chessboard in which he articulated exactly what the United States is doing right now. Um, there is a RAND report from 2019 in which, again, they articulated exactly what's going on. So some foreign policy thinkers in the U.S. for years have been writing, we will use Ukraine 
and I'm uh, paraphrasing, but we will use Ukraine as a blunt object. We will weaponize Ukraine and use this country as a blunt object to um, take Russia down, to destroy Russia, to break Russia up, and then go in and steal all of its resources, to plunder Russia, right? So if you read what they've, all you have to do is read what these people have been saying and then look at the current conflict. And it's blatantly obvious that what's going on right now is exactly what was it written, written by uh, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1998, exactly what was written in 2019. And then when it happens, they change the story and just pretend that those things were never written and simply now rearrange it to um conveniently start in february of 2022 and say well they russians are now and this changed um the uh russians want to take ukraine to re-establish the soviet union or you know various other things that you know sound good but to if you choose to believe the that that you know it, 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 and, and let me add this here's what's important and if you under and if you want to believe that there's no such thing as Russia, there is no country called Russia. There's only Vladimir Putin. Putin did this. Putin did that. If you look in Europe, if you look at the U.S., you will understand that the foundation of their argument is that there's no such country as Russia. There is an evil person named Vladimir Putin who makes all the decisions and all of his decisions is evil. His nature is evil. It's almost like a, you know, like a movie that came out of Hollywood where you there's where you oversimplify the geopolitical um issues involving Ukraine and you just say there's one person the person's a madman and this madman must be dealt with he's making now Putin did this read really, you never see Russia it's just Putin 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 that's a way of brainwashing people into Saddam Hussein is an evil guy and he's doing this Putin's he's evil Assad is doing this in the past colonial and imperial um countries when they went around the world they would say the people are savages we must go to this country and because these people are savages we can just kill them and of course they happen to have gold and other resources and we'll take their gold and other resources they're savages they won't be needing it they wouldn't even know what to do with it so we dehumanize the people and go in and rob the country the dehumanizing the people is so that the people in your country won't question the uh the, the morality of what you're doing well now rather than dehumanize the entire country and say they're savages you just take which would be more difficult you take the leader of the country putin assad maduro whoever you dehumanize the one evil villain who runs the country and now you can justify that it's just putin we have to deal with him same mm -hmm. same same game just a different um method at this point well you know you know yesterday because of that that you that you just said uh, yesterday i was reading a piece uh, written by bbc uh, concerning the coup d'etat in niger and then i started to search for more pieces uh, of the coverage made by the Western uh, media outlets. And they always refer to the president of Niger as the democratically elected president of Niger. But they never do, they never use the same words when speaking of Putin, uh, or even when they were about to, to, to make any kind of coverage of the topple of uh, Viktor Yanukovych back in Ukraine. So, and he, they both were democratically elected presidents yet they don't deserve the same kind of treatment because this is like uh, 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 ling uh, uh, words that they try to use in order to persuade people to think in a certain way. But that now to cover the coup d'etat in Niger, they always use the, the, the expression democratically uh, elected president of Niger. Always, 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 entire time. And uh, some authors, for example, um, concerning the Euromaidan, they see in Euromaidan a kind of spontaneous revolution that was absorbed by elites uh, linked to politi political interests close to the United States. And afterwards, we looked at the evidence and realized that Joe Biden at the time, he was already the superior responsible for the people, for people like Jeffrey Piat, Victoria Nuland, Wendy Sherman, and many others. All of them, like Arsenia Tsenyuk, who actually had some 
intensive training in the United States and also in Ukraine, all of them were involved in the coup d'etat in Ukraine and that subsequently uh, they were all entitled to top positions in the power structure of the United States government with Joe Biden. What do you think was Joe Biden's participation in uh, and involvement in Euromaidan? Well, clearly, um, it was a continuation of a long-term policy, which focused on, um, war, let's be frank, it focused on world domination, and it focused on, um, uh, um, you know, seeing the uh, the Rus Russian Federation as a regional power that was becoming a world power that could compete with the United States and that had an independent foreign and economic policy that refused to acquiesce to the the, the the whims of the of the U.S. empire and they had to take it down and Joe Biden was a significant part of that ideological crusade to go after them. Now, what happened after the Maidan, I mean, he was, they were intricately involved in the Maidan coup. In fact, Victoria Nuland has admitted to pumping $5 billion into Ukraine in the years, in the just a few short years leading up to the Maidan so they could set the dynamics in place to overthrow the government of Ukraine. Upon overthrowing the government of Ukraine, at that point, Joe Biden was effectively what the British would call during their colonial, when their obvious colonial period, when they would overthrow a country, they would put a person in charge and they would refer, refer to that person as either the governor or the viceroy. Joe Biden was effect, effectively the viceroy of Ukraine. He was in charge of it. They answered to him. The U.S. And, and, and you know what's interesting? that during the colonial periods of uh, the US, uh, of the British Empire, the well obvious colonial period, I would argue it hasn't gone away. What happened with a lot of countries that they overthrew was the sons and children of the ruling elite who were those who were, you know, miscreants and ne'er-do-wells, those who were problematic. If you're a very powerful and rich member of the nobil class nobility, you've got a son and he's problematic. You send him way out to one of these um, colonies to be one of the ruling members of the ruling elite there and to hopefully straighten him out. And that's a place where you can kind of hide him. So the people that would often go out to run these colonies and to run the, the, that with the colonial heads were people who were problematic at home and they'd send them out. Well, look at Joe Biden. Joe Biden's not very bright. He's extremely corrupt. You look at his son. Well, the, that speaks for himself. So it really was the same pattern. The person that they sent out to run that was a person that was not very bright with a family of total and complete corruption. And they went out there and they made their fortune as um, as as the noble class tended to do. They tended to during the British imperial period, you go out there and you make your fortune. In other words, you rob and steal the new colony. That's what Joe Biden's um, job. Two things. You're sent out there to kind of run things and hopefully keep things in order. And you're told while you're there, make all the money you can, do whatever you want, and we'll just turn our head and won't pay attention to it as long as you don't cause too many problems. That's what Joe and his uh, people did. And because of the um, ubiquitous, shall we say, corruption in the U.S. empire and throughout the U.S. government, Joe Biden and his uh, Joe Biden's son was actually involved with intelligence agencies, with the Pentagon, funneling money into his pocket, funneling money out to these uh, biological research, uh, research uh, um, uh, uh, facilities. He was. How, how is it that Hunter Biden is involved in bi getting money to and from biological research? He literally was involved in that. Uh, facilities because it was accepted that look you're part of the team you're going to go in there and get rich so basically they overthrew through a government so they could use it to attack to, to go after russia but they also took the opportunity to plunder the country that they were um in charge of they they had things there and these crooks had to go in there and steal it and it makes actually a lot of sense because when we think that Hunter Biden, two months after the, the consummation of the coup d'etat in Ukraine and the fall of Viktor Yanukovych, he was appointed to Burisma Company. Why? 
what was he, the experience he had back then and why he need to go to Burisma, to the oil company of Ukraine? And why did he get, he received $5.5 million between 2017 and 2018 from Ukraine? So these are many, there are many questions arising, at least I, I think that they are arising, that they, they need answers. But no one dares to answer them and to, to investigate these, all these questions because many people will say that people are hunting, not Hunter Biden, but they are just trying to influence the political spectrum in the United States. And this is some kind of uh, persecution that we do against Joe Biden. Uh, for, and when I look at this, for example, a few days ago, uh, he, uh, he spoke on the program, uh, you spoke on the program on your uh, YouTube channel about Hunter Biden, that Hunter Biden is much more than a connection uh, to prostitutes and drug abuse. What exactly were you referring to? Um, well, uh, a, a couple of things. I'll, just, I'll answer one of the things that you said earlier when you mentioned talked about the questions surrounding Hunter Biden, Joe Biden that need to be looked in and that they won't. Uh, you know, my former uh, career was in law enforcement and, and ultimately I was a law enforcement official in the United States here in, a, in, in my local state. And my and I taught um, investigations, things of that nature. And whenever there's a question that people don't want to look into, it's because they already know the answer. Now, if you ask the questions about why was Hunter Biden on the Burisma board and all those questions, everyone in the chat right now already knows all of those answers they're, because they're axiomatic, because they're self-evident. You know, if you if if my son is, you know, can barely, you know, read his and write his own name and he becomes, you know, the head of a of a major corporation and they're paying him, he doesn't even speak the language of that corporation, has no experience in that corporation but I'm a very powerful man, it becomes obvious. And I suddenly, mysteriously, the things that that corporation wants to happen that I can make happen suddenly start to happen. The, uh, the answers, the, these questions answer themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know why they won't, um, why they won't look into um, the Hunter Biden uh, uh, issue because they already know the answers. And I forgot, what's this, the last part of the question? Oh, the, the other part of the question was, uh, actually, you mentioned that Hunter Biden is not only and is way much more than connections that he has with prostitutes and drug abuse uh, or drug use. What exactly were you referring to? So yeah. who is actually Hunter Biden? He's way more than this. Yes. So one of the things that happened, I have interviewed um, one of my interviews um, on my channel was with a guy named Andre Telejinko. Aaron Mate also had a, even actually a better, the best interview would be Aaron Mate on the gray zone with a guy named Andre Telejinko. Everyone should watch that um, because he was worked with Hunter Biden. He worked with the company Blue Star Strategies that was involved with Hunter Biden. He worked for the U.S. Embassy. He worked for the prosecutor general. This guy was in the middle of all of it. And what he was able to articulate was that Hunter Biden was in the middle of an operation that was really run by the intelligence community so that he was the intelligence community had things they needed to do and wanted to do in the um, in Ukraine regarding these, whether it's the um, uh, uh, um, biological research labs or other things that they wanted to do involving corruption and that Hunter Biden um, was allowed to skim off of that. Hey, we've got some criminal things we need to do. You're the vice president's son. If you want to get your part come on over and get your part and you can get your, 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 your Joe Biden son. And, and at this, that also creates leverage. So now the intelligence community owns Joe Biden's son because they have so much dirt on him. If Joe Biden ever decides he doesn't want to go along with what they want, they can say, we got all of this dirt on your son and on you. We can take you out anytime you want to. So there was, I think, a dual um, utility to Hunter Biden, to the intelligence community being utilizing Hunter Biden. A, they enrich him, they enrich his son, everybody's happy. But in the long run, if they ever need to utilize that to coerce Joe Biden into making a decision that he doesn't want to make, they own him because they can take him out and they can take his son out anytime they want to. 
So I think that was Hunter Biden. But it, the important thing to understand is this wasn't just a criminal operation where Hunter Biden came in and made money and Joe Biden made money. There was a lot more to it than that. Keep in mind something. When Hunter Biden was on the board of Burisma, right, the board of directors, who else was on there? Kofor Black former CIA head of counterintelligence operations, right beside him. They're on the board. When you've got a CIA top guy, who former guy who's on the board with you, who else was on the board with him? The former uh, prime minister or president, whatever he was, of Poland. At the same time, so the, the government is violently overthrown. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you got the former Polish prime minister, you got some high ranking CIA guy and you got the vice president's son. So that should tell you that there were some very um, uh, 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 untoward schemes and machinations going on. And Hunter Biden was in the middle of them. It wasn't about him. He was in the stream of corruption and illegality that was going on. And he was allowed to partake of it. And he was allowed to get his, his fair share of it. <laughs> and even recently, uh, I, I watched Tucker Carlson interviewing Devon Archer. Uh, who actually was a former business partner of Hunter Biden. And during the dialogue, uh, Archer showed the, uh, Car uh, Tucker Carlson uh, compromising evidence on the Biden plan. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking of a love letter, which, which in 2011 was written to Archer by then U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, the future pres then, then the future president of the country, who actually I'm speaking of Joe Biden, he wishes then on that love letter, good luck to the to the entrepreneur and thanks him for interesting initiatives that made it possible to bypass the barriers to, to doing business with the authorities of other states. And in addition, Joe Biden complains about the head of China back then, who was Hu Jintao, uh, from whom he cannot get rid of in any way. Do you think this is also important because Biden has been stubbornly asserting lately that he allegedly did not discuss any business issues with his son and his partners? And it also demonstrates the huge extent of his influence and uh, connection with corruption cases? Yes, absolutely. I think this is these things are critical because I think you realistically, in order to deal with Joe Biden, he must first be discredited. And I think that he has been significantly discredited by the um, clear evidence that he lied to the American people. It was, you know, the um, equivalent of uh, Bill Clinton saying, I did not have sex with that woman. People never forgot that because he looked the American people in the face and he lied to them. Now, that's what presidents do. That's what our government does all the time. But at least they try to hide it or, you know, try to pretend that they're not. They, he was caught. Joe Biden was caught looking into the camera saying, I didn't. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't, didn't know anything about my son's business. I had no idea, you know, and now we find out that he was intricately involved in it. And um, so I think that these things are, are, uh, are, are very, very important um, that he is being exposed and that ultimately it makes it more and more difficult for the system to hide the corruption because now people are going to start looking you know, um, behind the scenes, they're going to start opening doors, looking in the closet, saying, what do we have here? And so I think it's um, um, it, it is important to expose Joe Biden. And, the, and I think what's important is to understand that it's not that Joe Biden. That here's the thing. This is not a Joe Biden issue. This is a corruption issue that there is, as I like to put it, there is a stream of corruption. Joe Biden reaches into that stream. He pulls out his his part. Someone else reaches into that stream and they pull out their part. They all reach in and they get their part, their part. But there's a consistent stream of corruption, whether it's um, Afghanistan or whatever the case may be. It's a stream of corruption. And that the United States and the, the Joe Biden and his ilk are on an ideological crusade. It's an ideological worldwide crusade that and, and, and the world has to understand the malevolent um, intentions of the people that are running the United States government at this time. So that might explain also uh, the interest of Joe Biden in Taiwan. Even yesterday, we got the news that he intends to transfer a part of the money that was supposed to be dedicated to to go to Ukraine to Ukraine uh, to be transferred to Taiwan. 
What do you think of that? What could be the interest of Joe Biden in Taiwan? We believe that it's not only to help Taiwan's or Taiwanese self-determination. Uh, it's It has nothing to do with that. But what do you think of that? Well, uh, here's the, the thing. Um, to me, when people bring up Taiwan, I say you cannot talk about Taiwan with talking about without talking about Ukraine. The two are inextricably linked. Um, the the there. I, I mean, if you look at it like this, there are three really world powers right now. There's the United States. There's Russia. There's China. Everyone else is insignificant. And, you know, all the other countries, there are no other countries that have the kind of, you know, military and economic power that these three countries have. So there are three world superpowers right now. One of the world superpowers has come to the border of the other two and is pumping weapons into the border of the other two, not Ukraine, not Taiwan, both, and using the exact same excuse. We are pumping weapons into Taiwan to prevent and deter war. We are um, surrounding uh, China with missiles to prevent and deter war. What did we do? What did we do? What did we argue with Ukraine? Oh, we've got to arm Ukraine to be able to defend itself with Russia. It's exactly the same thing. The question is, will the people of Taiwan understand that they are being sacrificed, that they are being put in a position where they will face the exact same consequences as um, Ukraine if the United States empire has its way. I do believe that one of the things um, that's happening is that the people in Taiwan are waking up to the reality. I mean, inadvertently, I don't know, do you, do you know the story about my Taiwan tweet? Yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the yeah. so I, 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 you know, had my big tweet in Ta that went viral in Taiwan and China and all of Asia inadvertently, not meaning to, but it really did because I simply tweeted jokingly that the U.S. was going to destroy Taiwan, that they had a plan for the destruction of Taiwan. And the people of Taiwan just simply, it, it went viral because the people in Taiwan are starting to look at what happened at Nord Stream and look at what's happening to Ukraine. And I think that there are a, the, the, the people, even though they're highly propagandized by the U.S.'s puppet government in Taiwan, they're starting to recognize the dynamics that the U.S. would be happy to sacrifice, the, sacrifice their lives just to threat, you know, to weaken China. <laughs> yes. If, so that's their intention, and we actually know that how they look at China, at least this democratic leadership, uh, not only Joe Biden, but how also how President Obama used to look at uh, China and how the Chinese could pose a problem to the to the to the American domination or at least hegemony uh, worldwide. But one just one last question before we leave this and we finish this extraordinary conversation that we are having but i know that not only you but maybe um i will leave i can leave for some other day uh we continue and or we, we make another interview in some other day in order to continue and to speak about more uh, uh present topics but one last question is uh, what kind of projects do you have for the future and what advice would you like to leave for our audience um, I'm, I just plan to continue what I'm doing. You know, I have my YouTube show. I have my radio shows. So I continue to, you know, I'm just going to continue what I'm doing. I enjoy it. Um, the, what I would give, the, the advice that I would give to people is continue to research, continue to research alternative, a lot of alternative news um, uh, options such as this one. Um, there are many and um, try to keep an open mind about the information that you're being given, ask questions about the things that the people in power are are giving you, and look for ways to, um, val you know, validate or to discredit the narratives that you're being given by the powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, nice. That's really nice. And ladies and gentlemen, this was Garland Nixon with us. It was a huge pleasure to have him with us today. I'm just going to ask him uh, not to leave because I'm just going to say goodbye uh, and leave my farewells to, to all our audience. And uh, thank you once again for being with us today and help us to understand some kind of some problems and also some uh, singularities of uh, American policies as well as some worldwide um, uh, events taking place, not only now, but that took place also in the past. 
Thank you everyone for watching us and I hope to see you soon again. And don't forget that uh, within more or less 24 hours, I will leave the subtitles. I will add the subtitles in Portuguese, English, and also in Russian in order to help all other viewers to uh, follow and to be able to see uh, this extraordinary talk with Gerlin Nixon. Thank you everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.